Hello and welcome to Tau Capes. I'm Cody Nestor. He's Ty Hill. What's up, guys? Today we're discussing Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. Many years after the reign of Caesar, a young ape goes on a journey that will lead him to question everything he's been taught about the past and make choices that will define a future for apes and humans alike. Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes was released on May 8, 2024. It currently has a Rotten Tomatoes score of 80% and an audience score of 80%. So let's talk spoilers. So Todd, I'm going to steal this line from the Weekly Planet. So what did you think the story was? So uh, basically we have a little beginning scenario where we see like uh, kind of a loose end type from the original trilogy. We see uh, this, you know, the kind of the funeral for Caesar. He's being kind of burned a la Darth Vader in Return of the Jedi. Mm -hmm. <laughs> then we kind of flash forward look, several generations. The film tells us uh, we're introduced to a character named Noah. He has two friends and they're kind of off uh, looking for uh, eagle eggs, stealing eagle eggs from nests. We come to find out that they're part of a little clan of apes that kind of raises and uh, uses eagles yeah it's like a falconry i guess yeah, is, there, falconry, is, there, yeah. is there a big thing for their clan his uh yeah they're kind of out i guess like a rite of passage pretty much for the village like it's like a coming of age type of thing you go you get your eagle egg you raise the eagle up you train it it becomes like you know you're kind of its master and it's kind of your companion and it's like i guess the coming of age kind of ceremony right and right. you kind of see like the setup of like What's going on in the village, I guess. And then you also have uh, kind of a little bit of dynamics between, like, you got Noah, who's our main character. Let's see, his buddies are Anaya. He's got, like, kind of a goofyish kind of buddy named Anaya. Yes. And then his kind of love interest, her name is Suna. Suna. So we kind of get those kind of set up from the start. Also, his father, he's, like, he's the falconer. Yeah, he's like the one that he's like the he's not the elder. He's one of the elders of the village because we kind of see them a little bit. But he's the guy that's like really in charge of making sure like of that ceremony of that coming of age kind of thing of, you know, pretty much over the whole falconry kind of bit here. So like pretty much the film kind of starts off. It, it does kind of start slowly it's a slow for, start yeah it is a little slow of a start like now i mean we saw the reviews kind of have a little criticism of like i don't think it's like too slow i never got bored yeah i mean the whole time what is it like 225 the runtime mm -hmm. I, I never got bored i was never bored yeah like i don't think it drags on too long i mean it does but then you're also setting up like a whole you're also setting up the setting you're also trying to introduce a new main character his family dynamic kind of setting up what the world's about a little bit with right. like you know the the state of their village and setting up the kind of other like rival clans and just you know a little bit of world building so you would expect it to be kind of slower at the start we're not you know it's not like rise like rise of the planet Apes. we watched it a few weeks ago it's not like we're just jumping right into like action scene after action i mean you right. take your time to like build things up and just like in this movie and like pretty much the the beginning kind of things that kind of set everything in motion is pretty much uh he gets his egg they all three get their egg he finds yeah. his egg he ends up doing a climb to the like the highest i guess eagle nest that he can find uh, but he gets uh, followed back to a village, his village, by uh, a random human, kind of a scavenger. You don't really see the person at first, and then he kind of he's kind of a, a, the one awake at night, and he kind of runs into this person in like one of their little huts, mm -hmm. and ends up like smashing his egg. Like you kind of see it, like in his little, I don't know, band, his egg bandolero he's wearing around his <laughs> right, chest, right. and then like you kind of see it, like kind of smashed all to pieces. Yeah, and then. From that point, uh, he kind of sets out, I guess, um, he's setting out to go find another egg. Because, like, he, the coming of age ceremony is, is the next morning. The next yeah. morning, which I don't know how he was going to get an egg, get back in time for the coming of age ceremony. Luckily, he doesn't have to because his whole village gets burned to the ground. Right. He don't have to worry. The egg is the least of his problems now. So, yeah, there's these, like, rival bands of, like, apes. And they're, like, kind of, like, almost, like, I guess like religious kind of zealots. They're like followers of Caesar, but like in the most like twisted way twisted possible. Twisted way, like <laughs> the complete opposites of the, the belief system that Caesar had from like the last, you know, three, you know, films that we watched where I was Dawn in War. Like so it's like a complete opposite, like bastardization version of like the Caesar belief system. Mm -hmm. And he kind of comes across some of them. They, they don't notice him. They notice his horse. They follow his horse back to his village. And by the time he gets there, they've kind of, they burn everything down. They've killed like their biggest, strongest, like, uh, ape, like, uh, mm -hmm. ape guard guy. They've killed him. Uh, they end up like 
setting everything ablaze and his father ends up getting killed by like you know the main our main guy was his name silva yeah silva i guess the main henchman the main heavy yeah the main heavy in the film is like this big huge again big gorilla gorillas are always your heavy in these apes films and he's like set up as your kind of like your big bad like kind of second in command to the character we'll see later and uh that kind of sets everything in motion his village is burned to the ground he gets up the next morning after he wakes up they're gone. His family's gone. His villagers have been taken. He buries his father, and then we're kind of set out. The rest of the film is kind of his adventure, his journey to try to find his family and try to bring them back to the village. Exactly, yeah. Uh, he meets a couple people along the way. You want to tell us who he meets along the way here, Todd? Uh, he meets an orangutan named Raka, mm-hmm. and a, we find out that the human has kind of been, you know, uh, tailing him, kind of, you know, peeking around his village as a female adult uh we the uh, orangutan kind of names her nova because he says you know we call them all nova <laughs> yeah so like Raka, he's kind of like he's like i guess noah's spiritual guide kind he's of a the guru. obi-wan kenobi to yeah. Luke skywalker <laughs> at this point really like he's he's kind of set up he's teaching him the real beliefs of the of caesar mm-hmm. what caesar was really all about he's kind of teaching him the history of like where he comes from, where apes come from, and like the again that belief system that kind of Caesar kind of sets up. So it's a very like mentor, protege kind of relationship. Right. What did you think about Noah, like as a main character altogether? Uh, I actually liked Noah. I didn't have any problems with Noah. You know, he kind of he goes on what they kind of call, or I kind of call that, you know, like a unwilling heroes type journey. You know, he's got a set path that he thinks he's going to be going down as this movie starts. You know, he's coming of age. He's going to have his egg ceremony. He's going into the falconry. Mm -hmm. And then all that gets turned upside down. You know, his father gets killed. His entire clan gets, you know, stolen and retook someplace. And he has to go find them. He has to take up the mantle of, you know, basically the leader of his village to go bring them back home. Yeah, his the coming of age is like instead of it being done, like I said, in like you said, in that ceremony, it's, he he learns through through doing really yeah like, through his travels yes. and his escapades yeah so the traditions of the village it's it's by saving his family and braving the perils of like the outside world and learning about ape history and learning about the nature of apes and the nature of humans and also that there are there are obviously bad apes and there's also good humans and like right. kind of like learning that there's a balance there and the world isn't so black and white as it's seen from like the inside of his uh his village what did you think about raka he's our orangutan he's like he gives a little bit of levity to the film a yeah. little bit of comedic edge and a little comedic time in yeah. there what did you think about the character of he, raka? He, he might be my favorite character in this movie i really like that character like you say he's that old he's the old wise the old sage you know he remembers the ways of caesar the way we you know the original teachings the way it should have been mm-hmm. I think he actually wears uh, the symbol around his neck was is a symbol of that window from all the mm-hmm. way back in Rise. Yeah, which we see too. They've kind of carved it on a rock at Caesar's funeral at the beginning yeah. of the film. Yeah, I think it's it's a good character. Like you know, not to jump too far ahead, but uh, like I was really bummed out when his character kind of disappears from the film. Right. Later on, uh, Nova. He kind of mentioned her. So Nova, she is a human. She is. They kind of, she's been trailing them the whole way. She was the one he bumped into in the village that broke his egg. Mm-hmm. She's been trailing uh, Ro- uh, Raka and Noah the whole time that they've been traveling. Raka kind of takes pity on her. He gives her some food. He gives her a blanket, kind of gets her to like come closer and kind of from there, they kind of form this little, you know, like it's unlikely <laughs> trio. Yeah, this like bond and this like little unlikely kind of trio. We'll, we'll talk about her like a little bit. Uh, later on, I would say, well, now let's, let's get into it. Like, so let's go ahead and talk about her. So what do you think of Nova slash we've come to find out later name is actually May. Yeah. There's a, there's more to her than meets the eye. Cause you know, first we originally see her. We think she's just one of those, you know, virus infected humans that she's kind of reverted primitive. back primitive. She can't speak. She has yeah. any no limited or no intellect, but as we come to find out, she is very intelligent and she can speak and she, she's got her own agenda. Yeah. There's a reason why she's wanting to take Noah to that place where his clan has been taken. <laughs> yeah, I was kind of, I think for, I would say for the most part in the film, I would say I was like indifferent to her most of the film. And like you said, she does, she, she's not, she's never really overly likable. 
Yeah, she's kind of. Is it almost ambiguous in a way? Yeah, she. It, yeah, it doesn't go out. The film doesn't go out of its way to say she's bad or good. She's kind of like just. She's just her character is very ambiguous. She could kind of see it going either way, but she's not made to be overly likable. You know, she's not really a damsel in distress, even though they do have a scene where they kind of rescue her. She's not really, yeah. she's capable, and she, you know, obviously to, to survive in this world, you have to kind of be at this point. But, like, I was kind of indifferent to her for most of the film until, like, the ending. Like, I think um, the actress that played her, her name is Freya Allen. I think she did a good job within the role. Mm -hmm. Like, I think everybody did. You know, Owen T, he plays Noah. Like, she, he did a good job. Peter Macon, he played Raka. Uh, and Freya Allen, she does a good job here as well. I just don't think she was given a lot to do right. until like the very end of it mm -hmm. and like the things that she did have to do like it didn't it didn't add a lot and it didn't detract from it either like i was just kind of she was kind of there until she was kind of along for the ride until she started getting in the driver's seat for a little bit and then we kind of see what happens with her at the end as we kind of go forward. Yeah, and I will say there's a little scene with her and Noah at the end where uh, she doesn't specifically do anything, but she's, I'll say, prepared to do something that right. really makes me want to fucking hate her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's why, like, there's that, there's that, like, kind of that, that moral ambiguity to her. Like, yeah. You know, there, you're always kind of uneasy about her and the relationship that she has with, with Noah and everybody else kind of around her. Uh, when Noah and Raka, they're they're kind of in, you know, especially when Noah first sets out there, you kind of see like a, he's going on his journey. He's like on horseback. Obviously, this is a world I think three hundred years after Caesar. Some of right. those kind of set up. So like, what those movies, Rise, Dawn, and War, kind of set in and around San Francisco, Los Angeles kind of area. Yes. But now the world has become it's become like really overrun, overgrown. Nature's kind of taking things back. Like, mm -hmm. did you notice any kind of like landmarks as you went through? I noticed a couple, but did you notice any? There was one where I thought I saw like well, it was the remnants of like a stadium. Yeah, like a ballpark, like yeah. a baseball field. Yeah, I saw that one. I think there was an airport. I think that's kind of where he first meets Raka, if I'm not mistaken. It's like okay. kind of in like a like an abandoned airport. Yeah. And the other one that I noticed that they kind of it's featured in one scene in the middle of the film and it's at the end of the, as well as like I guess it's like a observatory, observatory if I can talk. Right, right. Like with a giant like telescope. Telescope, yeah. That kind of like he kind of looks through for the first time and I, you kind of get this scene where it's like he's kind of seeing how big the world really is, I guess, not just he's he's he he's kind of been in this like kind of like you know, no pun intended, this nest his whole life, right. you know, yeah. and he's kind of been sheltered in this like village, the confines of his village. And then he's kind of seeing what else is out there as he travels. But then he's also seeing like even further than that, like there's, What's pla above there's him, planets yeah. and stars and everything else. So you kind of get a, a scene where he's in that observatory looking through that telescope at the beginning of the film. And he also kind of brings back um, uh, Suna at the end of the film. Uh, talk us uh, through uh, what goes on with Silva and the whole bridge ambush there, Todd. That's about the middle point of our movie, about our second kind of, well, our third kind of action set piece. We got the attack on the village. Got a pretty good rescue scene where they rescue um, May from, May the, from uh, Silva right. and them. You know, he's like on horseback and kind of grabs her. Pretty good action scene there. Then your third kind of action set piece is like the bridge ambush. Tell us about that. So May has kind of let uh, Raka and Noah know that she knows where his clan has been taken and she can take them there. And of course, we'll learn a little later there's an agenda for her why she wants to go there. But they're on their way there, and they kind of have to cross this bridge, and it's it's a setup. It's a trap because Silva and his gang is there waiting for them, and they kind of, you know, kind of like in the Temple of Doom, there's, there's baddies here. There's baddies <laughs> behind you. Right. They're coming towards the middle, yeah. and uh, in the skirmish, May kind of gets almost knocked completely off the bridge. I think she kind of grabs some netting there mm -hmm. to kind of kind of hold on to at the end. Rocker's trying to get her back on, and in that, he kind of loses his balance. He gets her back, but he falls off. He's clinging on by a thread by the netting, and then Silva just kind of walks up and just cuts that last bit of rope, and uh, Rock is gone. Yeah, that's where I was mentioning before. Like I was, I was actually kind of genuinely kind of bummed out that I was hoping that he might come back. We might find him a little later, washed up on the riverbank. But he's nah, out. He's down. He's done. He drowned in the river. And uh, but I mean, again, I, the criticisms I've read, a lot of them, like you know, the people that don't like this movie, they say it's a, too much of a slow burn and it's boring. But I'm like. The action stuff is paced fairly well. Yeah. Like I said, it's it's maybe 20 minutes in and you get the villages burned to the ground. Then after that, maybe 10, 15 minutes later, you've got 
them rescuing May from Silva and like this whole like horseback chase mm-hmm. and them chasing them. Then maybe 15 minutes after that, you got you've this. got the bridge yeah. ambush scene. And then after that, it's a little bit more of the world building to meet some characters we're about to talk about. But like, I never felt, again, I wasn't bored. I didn't feel like it was like too slow or too rushed or anything. Like I felt like it was paced pretty well for a, a film that has to introduce a whole new not exactly a whole new universe, but has to introduce characters in the same universe 300 years past what we've seen before. True, true. Uh, so I don't know. Yeah. I don't I don't really get the criticism of it it's being too slow or it being boring. Um, so we we kind of learn once May and all of them they're kind of they're kind of captured, they're taken back to we've kind of heard rumblings from Silva and throughout the film that there's kind of this like what would you call this kind of enigmatic leader of apes at some settlement? His name's Proximus, and that's who, who Silva and his kind of group is working for. Mm-hmm. So, like, May ends up, uh, or well, they all get taken. May, Noah, they get taken, and Raka is gone. They all get taken to his kind of little, I guess, like beach side. Compound, yeah, complex. settlement, which yeah. is like they have like a, a dam that's kind of walled off the ocean yeah. from like coming in because they're there. There's some like empty like cargo container ships, like you know, huge, gigantic, like you know, hollowed out ships have been like washed ashore there, right. and it's kind of set at the face of this kind of like mountain bunker. And so you kind of meet Proximus for the first time, and like the character of Proximus, um, it's. It is a very – he's played by Kevin Durant, and I I did not know that that's who played him. And then I did not know that that actor's name was actually Kevin Durant. He's always been one of those, like, that guys to me. Like, oh, that guy that played the blob in Wolverine, X-Men Origins Wolverine. Oh, okay. Or <laughs> that guy that Russell Crowe stabbed in the neck in 310 to Human with a fork. He's, like, he's always been, like, that guy. That guy. Yeah, but he plays Proximus, and, like, I don't know what you thought about the character, but, like, I – I like the character. It's just I think it was mostly based on more his performance than it was like substance to the character or the characterization. It was mostly just because I enjoy his performance and how kind of, I don't know, bombastic and over the top he was a little right. bit more than it. He's like he's not that deep and depthful of interest in the character. I just really kind of enjoyed the character because like I guess the performance. He just goes so over the top with it. Yeah, it's a lot of like, crown. what a wonderful day. Yeah, he's got the know? crown and he's up there. He's like, what a wonderful day. Yeah, it's like it's a, it's a lot of that kind of stuff. He's but working like, the crowd. Yeah, he's he's very much like um, like a televangelist in a way, if you yeah, to think yeah. about it. He has that kind of like, because he is kind of leading, you know, his, his goal is to like empower his species and like lead them to greater heights mm-hmm. with like, he wants that bunker open. His his sole goal is like he knows that they, the uh, the humans had some good shit in that bunker, mm-hmm. and he's determined to get them. You see, like there's a scene where they're like they uh, they must try to open it every day. They're like putting like kind of like I don't know if it's like thermite or some kind of explosives around it. They've got apes trying to pull it down with chains, and, like they just can't get into yeah. it. He's kind of has this like religious undertone to him because he he call, his name is Proximus, but his name is Proximus Caesar. He he he's he find you know he thinks of himself as the new Caesar. The How new, dare you? Yeah, the new <laughs> lead, leader of the apes as well. Uh, there's a character name, a human character name, uh, Trevathan. You want to talk about Trevathan, Don? Uh, Trevathan is the character played by William H Macy, and uh, he's basically just uh, you know he's got this philosophy now. If you can't beat him, join him. You know, yeah. he saw the or he thinks that the human race has fallen so far. There's no coming back from this. So he's just gonna he's gonna side with them. He basically just uh, I think he reads books to Proximus. He may tell him an amusing story or two here and there, yeah, and he's I'll, allowed to live. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking about that today. I was like, you know, this is the William H Macy character that we talked about, Trevathan, and like he's the other human there and he's kind of like Proximus is like a yeah, pet for lack of a better word. Like mm-hmm. you said, he's just kind of amuses him and tells him about Shakespeare and the actual Julius Caesar and all yeah. that kind of stuff. But I was like, it's never explained who he actually was mm-hmm. or what his deal was. I think he mentions that, he like he was out some he was out I don't know fucking around and broke <laughs> he fell and broke his ankles he says yeah yeah and Proximus found him and kind of and brought him in it is really like a 
uh, injured, you find a lame or injured animal and like you just nurse it back to health and allow it to stay in your home. Yeah. Like we would have done to a dog or a cat or something. Yeah. Yeah. Like it really, (laughs) it, he doesn't get anything more than that. Cause like pretty much by the time he's introduced two scenes later, he's, he gets choked to death. Yeah. (laughs) He may chokes him to death when they're, when they set out on their little mission to get in the bunker. I guess if there's a character that kind of feels thrown in or maybe tacked on, it would be him. It's like, he's just in it. It feels maybe a little like stunt casting where it's like, Hey, we We miss Macy. Oh, he's dead. <laughs> like you know, it's that it's that kind. There's of, a famous guy not in makeup. Oh, he's gone. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, to talk about the humans, to kind of follow up on that a little bit. So, like in Dawn, you had like you know there were humans that were like, uh, Ra set up the simian flu. In Dawn, there was humans that were immune to the simian flu, like Jason Clark and his little group and mm-hmm. Gary Oldman. They were immune to it. And in War, you had the simian flu had mutated. And now it's like it's robbing people of their humanity, basically turning them primitive. And it's become more aggressive and it's mutated and it's changing. And then in this, again, we're 300 years later, like, and we see there's like two kind of distinct groups of humans. There's like the real primitive looking like loincloths and fig leaves running around and the dirty, real dirty ones. Yeah, yeah. And then there's like May, who is like, she's still fine. She can speak. Trevathan, he's fine. He can speak. And they're also wearing more modern-looking clothes. Yeah. Like, I don't know if she was in jeans, but she had, like, almost, like, jeans and, like, a like a regular-looking shirt on. Right. And he had, like, a button-up shirt on and slacks or whatever. Yeah. Like, is it, like, do you think it's, like, that those humans, like, did they quarantine? Is that why they're not affected by this the mutated virus, they've just quarantined themselves and not exposed themselves to whatever, however you would go get it, which I guess by exposure to someone else or their clothing or stuff. Like, I didn't really get that as much. What do you, is that, are they immune? Or are they quarantining themselves? What do you I, think? I mean, I, I'm having to think that maybe they're still immune somehow because they're no longer quarantined because actually, you know, May's out there running around. And when, you know, when we have that kind of sequence where, she, you know, she's kind of getting corralled by Silva and those, you know, primitives are there, you know, she's in pretty close proximity to that stuff. I don't know if she touched any of them, but, you know, I know yeah. in War, that's how Woody Harrelson's character got his in that version of the virus, he touched that doll. So that was from an infect, another infected, infected human. human. Yeah. So the only thing that leads me to believe it, I don't know that it might, they, they're trying to maybe say that they're more quarantined or maybe they're, I don't know. It, it's just like when they're at the end of the film to jump ahead to the end of the film, when she goes back to her little place, they, the person opens the door for her is was wearing like a, hash, like a hazmat, hazmat suit. suit. Yeah. Yeah. They're right. You're it's right. It's not, well, it's not really clear. I could, I could see it being going either way. Like it, that's why I kind of want to bring it up. It's not really clear if they're like, they're immune or if they just quarantine themselves. And like the virus is now maybe kind of run its course. And like those that are affected are just infected and, I don't know. It's a little bit ambiguous, yeah. and there's room to expand upon that, I guess, if there, if we get a sequel to this. But yeah. I just wanted to kind of throw that in there. Uh, another big thing, I mean, obviously, this is a big, this is an effects-driven film. Like, what did you think about the effects? Like, do you, how'd you feel about them in general? Do you, would, would you feel like they're the same, or better, worse than what we've seen before, and like Rise, Dawn, and War? I still think they're they're on they're on that level. I thought they were really good. I thought everything with the uh, the mocap and the way you know all the different breeds of apes looked. I thought it was great. Yeah, there's something about like some of the designs of like. I don't know if maybe it's a different genus of apes or something. Mm-hmm. Like the way his father looks and his mother looks, like Noah's, like they look different. Yeah. I don't know if it's supposed if they're maybe is because they're a different genus or if it's just because we're so much in the future, or maybe it's because they're slowly starting to evolve. Like they have this kind of <laughs> I, just thinking about it now, his mama kind of looked like Rocky Dennis. <laughs> Whoa. Okay. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> she had like this kind of, her face was a little bit like Kind elong- of smushed in and well, elongated. Well, it was like smushed and then also like elongated. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I didn't know if it was like, again, a different, maybe she's a different genus of apes or maybe it's because that's just 300 years of evolution past it or maybe they're trying to slowly through these films, make them look a little bit more humanistic as, Mm -hmm. you know, you kind of, to where you get to like, you know, the Dr. Zayas versions of these apes, the ones you see in the 1968 original. I just, I don't know. It's just a little, some of them looked a little weird, not bad. Yeah. Just weird. I thought, uh, the one thing that kind of threw me was, uh, 
after having watched, you know, uh, Rise and Dawn and War was, you know, uh, other than Caesar, very few of them actually spoke. Mm. You know, they mostly signed. There were a few that spoke, but now, you know, here three hundred years later, you know, they're they're speaking fluently. Yeah. And true. if they do sign, it's just because someone's around. They don't want to speak around, then they'll still sign a little bit. But true. they're talking just extremely fluent. Yeah, that's true. And I think. I think I, I agree with you. I think the the effects are, are are just as good. I think they're I think the effects here are better than what you see in Rise. Yeah. I think Dawn and War. I think I mean I'm sure technically the, we're, you know, those movies come out in I think it was what 2011 Rise, 2014 Dawn, and 2017 War. Yeah. So we're quite a few years after that. So I mean, obviously the technology's gotten better. I think though Dawn and War still look better aesthetically, just because I think Matt Reeves knows how to make a nice looking movie. Right, right. Not that Wes Ball, who directs this one, doesn't. I just think Matt Reeves and the cinematography and everything. Like, there's some shots in Dawn that are just like unbelievably good Epic, looking. Yeah. Then there's never a shot in this movie that I'm like, wow. There's never a like Caesar in the trees at the beginning of Dawn that is kind of shot in this film. Right. Like, there's never that level. But I think the effects are, are kind of like fine. Um, another part of the film that you know we should touch on. What do you think about the the score, the music? I liked it. I mean, I, I don't think it's up there with you know War or, or Dawn, but I think it was a good solid score. Yeah, I don't. I didn't, it's one of those things I didn't, I didn't notice it too much until the end of the film. Yeah, you get to the end of the film and like um, it's like has that that score that's playing while you see May kind of rejoining her people. Mm -hmm. And um, Noah's kind of with his people and kind of establish where we leave that character. It's very, uh, it's very Hans Zimmer. It's very like end of, you know, the Dark Knight or like yeah. end of Inception or end of like you know any of those Christopher Nolan type movies where it's like kind of like hopeful, but like you know, oh, the world's expanding. Right. The music. The music's telling me. The music's expanding with the world. Yeah, this shit's about to get a little bigger. Yeah, that kind of thing. So. Uh, getting back to the story, let's kind of get to the the third act here and to the ending. Uh, you want to tell us what happens with uh, the bunker and kind of what May is actually up to and uh, all that good stuff there at the end? So May has kind of told uh, Noah and his two buddies that, you know, there's something in that bunker that she needs that can help humankind, that can help her race. Right. And she, she wants to get in there. And she also wants to get in there, too, because she's going to blow it up. She does <laughs> not want Proximus to get anything that's in that bunker. Right. So basically, uh, she kind of rigs that dam to blow. Then they have to kind of climb up and they get inside. And uh, actually, we find out that what she was after was like a, a satcom link. A sat, yeah, it's like a, a yeah, it's like a, a sat key or yeah, like a hard drive a too. Key, yeah, it's kind of I don't know. It looks like a hard drive to me, but like it could be like you said, it, it could be. It just kind of has that vibe. But like, yeah, it's basically to work some satellites. That we find out later. Yeah. Anyway. And uh, you know she she gets the satcom key. You know they're going to, they're going to open the bunker door. They're going to get out, and there's Proximus and the gang just stand there waiting for her at the door. <laughs> yeah, and she's uh she did find like the armory because the place is it's got tanks. It's full yeah, of it's full, it's of, full tanks. of guns. She ends up taking like a six shooter. Takes like a revolver. There's at one point uh, I think some of uh, Proximus's uh, his eight goons have like uh, who was it Suna? They've got her like one of them's got her by the behind the oh yeah, yeah like in a headlock. She caps him. She caps him like shoots him and you see like you know kind of blood running down and trickling from his chest. And, and she's, I thought, <laughs> I just thought it was cool that right after that Proximus kind of doubles back behind his apes and he's like, "May you could go ahead and get on out of here." <laughs> Did you notice that after that one ape got capped, yeah. he's like, "May you can go." <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, you're right. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, she kind of she uses like you know the 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 firepower she now has kind of back the fuck out of the bunker. Uh, this is where you also see Noah's kind of being like, "Bitch, what is, what is you up to?" Yeah, I feel like you've been using me a little bit. Yeah, like, what she did. What she did. Like that's where Noah starts to be like, "I don't you not all that you appeared to be." His kind of mistrust starts to come back for humans. Yeah, especially her. She caps that one ape, and nobody wants no part of it. And she she uses is that to kind of like as a distraction she blows that dam all the ocean kind of water kind of floods in it starts flooding that bunker and um noah kind of leads all his you know his family and his village up throughout the bunker to get to the top because they come in at the very top from like they ascended the mountain behind the bunker yeah to come in through like a exhaust fan or something right. like that and so he tries to lead him up there meanwhile silva ends up chasing him uh we kind of see him come to meet his demise through uh he kind of 
Noah kind of leads him through some like narrow piping inside the bunker, knowing that he eventually he's too big, he'll eventually get stuck. So you kind of see him kind of get stuck and kind of drowned inside yeah. that bunker, which was like a really good scene. It looked really mm-hmm. good. It was tense, like it, it was really it played out well. Noah kind of gets all his uh, his family up to the top at, out, out of that vent on the side of the cliff, and he has a little fight with Proximus. What do you think of the Proximus versus Noah fight? This is uh, not this fight in specific. This is one of those things where I kind of knew it was going to happen because earlier in the film, you know, we've kind of set up, you know, the Falcon with this clan, and, you know, Noah has kind of struggled with Falcons. You know, we saw when he goes up to kind of first meet his father, there's one that wants to light on his arm, but he won't do it. It's his father's, I yeah, think. His father's Falcon, he has a yeah. name, and I can't remember yeah. what it is. I should have looked and it up. And there's a couple of other times, you know, when on his travels that that Falcon will show up, and he won't quite land on his arm. And you just, somewhere in the back of my mind, I was like, that's going to play out somewhere <laughs> in this movie. That right. Falcon's going to fuck some shit up for him. Right. And it comes to roost here at the end, you know, Noah kind of, he, he, he hears the Falcon up above, and there's some others kind of Falcon. Falcons comes with it, and you know he starts singing that hum or that f- whatever they do to call him in, and it mm-hmm. just comes plops right on him. Then all the rest of them kind of start the clan starts you know humming that with him, and the rest of the Falcons come in just cover up Proximus, and he goes over the side of the cliff. Yeah, they like peck him to death, or they peck him so much that he it throws him on he his just own falls damn over, self yeah. off. He's off like the, enough of this. Yeah, Yay! exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah, they just peck the shit out of him, claw the shit out of him until he ends up falling off the cliff because he's. He's, uh, you know, it's kind of set up. He's he's the alpha, and, like, you know, yeah. no one's really wanting to challenge him. And, like, yeah, it is one of those things, like, you knew it was going to come back. But I, feel, I still think it was I feel, I still think it was satisfying. Yeah, like, it was a good scene. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. It was a great scene. It's just one of those things where, you know, you knew when you saw him earlier struggling, struggling with that Falcon, you knew eventually he was going to master that shit, and it was going to come back to help him somehow. Yeah, it wasn't one of those, like, setups where you're like, oh, saw that coming a mile yeah. away. It's one of those yeah. setups that's like, okay, I, I, I want to see this payoff. Off, yeah, kind of set up, and uh, it dies with you know Proximus, you know, chucking himself off the cliff. Um, but I, again, I thought it was a good scene. I thought it was a good continuing, like, to kind of evolve Noah's character. The real final kind of scene, the final ending, uh, we kind of see, you know, obviously May, she kind of run off after that, so we didn't know her whereabouts. Kind of maybe a few days later, maybe a little while later, it's kind of nebulous how long it is in the last final scenes we get. Noah, he's looking a little different. He's got like this kind of like falconry kind of like mm-hmm. armband kind of thing on. He's wearing the Caesar symbol necklace. He's wearing the necklace Rocka gave him, yeah. May comes to the village, and they're kind of having a little conversation about like, you know, it's really boils down to like, will humans and apes ever be able to coexist? Yeah. And she's kind of like, I don't know. And the whole time she's got a little six shooter. Yeah, bitch her brought back. a gun. She <laughs> was going to pop Noah. Yeah, or, Fuck you know, her. or I guess, you know, maybe <laughs> she, maybe in case something popped off, she wanted to be, she wanted to be prepared. But right. yeah, again, it just leads into that, like, that uneasiness between humans and apes and about coexistence. Is it possible? So we see the ending of the film follows May. And so she heads back to this kind of, uh, kind of like this kind of base looking thing, I guess, kind of like yeah. these, you know, kind of like base out in the middle of nowhere. She's greeted by somebody at the door. Like I mentioned before, they're in a hazmat suit. They kind of let her in. It's kind of like a little base, a little installation. that's kind of filled with other humans that again, these are not the primitive ones. These are smart, intelligent. They're, they're in this kind of a uh, little installation. She gives them that little key card, hard drive, whatever it is. Yeah. They plug it in. You see outside that there's a bunch of big ass satellites. And I guess that helps them, do with their satellite up blink and so they like their satellites start turning and one of the ladies gets on there and she's like is anybody out there and then you hear somebody come by there's like hey there's fort wayne indiana <laughs> yeah we're here yeah we're here boy <laughs> and we were joking after the movie uh that like what if they got like you know somebody in boston right like, yeah this is boston <laughs> i'm up here at fenway park yeah you guys still got any of them chinny pansies down there huh <laughs> you know? But it was Fort Wayne, Indiana. Though. It was Fort Wayne, Indiana. <laughs> and then again, you get your very uh, evocative of Hans Zimmer style music. The world's expanding. What's going on? Uh, potential sequel bait here wraps up. And then 
we closed out the film there. Uh, roll credits. Uh, what what did you think about the ending? Did you expect it? Was it unexpected? Did you see it coming? Did you feel like it should, was go was going to go a different way or should have went a different way? I honestly really didn't have any kind of expectations for the ending. I wasn't quite sure how they were going to wrap it up, but uh, you know, uh, it's kind of left open. You know, obviously for us, you know, they want to do some more sequels to this. I hope they do, because I was kind of I was intrigued by this movie. I, I would like to see another one of these. Yeah, for sure. I, I'd like to. I'm 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 game for another. I'm I'm hoping that they get to kind of expand this, and I'm definitely in for a sequel. I was thinking about it when I wrote this. That's the reason I kind of like put that question in is because like I was kind of hoping what the ending was going to be is like whatever she got that device that hard drive that mm -hmm. item I was hoping that the ending was going to be especially after she kind of like meets with him and they have this whole conversation of like can we trust each other can we coexist I don't know kind of thing I was hoping she was going to go back and once she got to that bunker that that device whatever it was going to be was going to be something that would launch like nuclear warheads or like oh, missiles or something right and maybe like you see from the village you see like those launching maybe from like Noah and his family perspective like you see them mm -hmm. launching and maybe they launch an attack against a different group of apes or a, a, a center of apes they know somewhere maybe they hit San Francisco where it were yeah you know Caesars you know his group used to be or somewhere they know there's a big population center of apes and that right. like starts another war well that and like maybe you lead into something maybe the next film is like conquest of the planet of the apes or okay something. i just thought that would be kind of cool yeah, i see that and i then, like that and concept then, like yeah. turn her character a little bit maybe to be even more menacing to be like can we trust each other and her be like i don't know mm -hmm. and then be like Eh. No, we can't no. trust each other. <laughs> we want our shit back. Yeah. Let's let the nukes or the missiles start flying. And you yeah. just kind of end on that note. And like maybe war is coming again. Like I thought that would be kind of a neat idea, but that may be what's going to happen. But I just thought that was, you know, with them trying to get into a bunker, like a new, you know, kind of a, you kind of think nuclear, you think like satellite targeting. Yeah. Yeah. I like you, see that. That kind of I put definitely me, see that. Kind of put me in that mind. I don't, I don't dislike the ending. I just thought that would be, I would really been like, oh, I want to see, I yeah. want to see where this goes. If something big had happened yeah. at the end, and it would have definitely hooked you, definitely for another one. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, ready to go into reviews, Todd? Yeah, I'm ready. All right, so let's go into the reviews. So we rank films on a one to ten scale, starting from one, the ranks are tortured, two awful, three bad, four subpar, five mediocre, six decent, seven good, eight great, nine amazing, and ten masterpiece. Todd, give us uh, your final thoughts and review score for Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. Uh, my biggest thing coming into this movie was I was concerned. I was really concerned about how soon or how close it was going to pick up to the other trilogy, if it was at all. You know, I'm kind of happy to say that, you know, it paid a little bit of lip service to the original trilogy at the very beginning. You know, but, it, you know, it went on, did its own thing. It doesn't tread over what we've already got. It kind of builds upon and uh, I really enjoyed this movie. I had a good time with it. Like I said, people have complained about the runtime, about maybe it dragging in places, but I never felt that. Uh, overall, I'm going to give this a seven. I think it is a good, solid apes movie. Um, yeah, I agree with a lot of that. I don't, I don't think it was boring. I don't think it was any less action oriented or action packed as some of the other sequels that we've gotten or from the other trilogy from rise dawn or war, you know, it is, it is more akin to rise and setting up things and more, right. more paced like rise was than dawn or war, which were a little bit more had bigger action set pieces. I would say this is, I, this to me, I can't understand the criticism that this was boring. I don't know. Uh, I think, like you said, it does, it pays homage. It made a smart decision to go, if this would have been like 15 years after Caesar or something, I think it's too close. Making it 300, really like pushing it forward in the future, I think was like a smart decision. Mm -hmm. I think the characters that it set up are interesting. You know, I think Noah's an interesting character. I like the performance by Owen Teague. Um, you know, some of the other side characters are not as fleshed out and the supporting cast now, obviously you've like introduced Raka, he's gone. You've introduced Proximus, he did. Yeah. Silva <laughs> did. So really now it's May and the, your characters are the apes in the village and May and her, her tribe, right. so to speak. So like, I'm still interested to see where it goes. I think the effects were great. I think there's the score was fine. Like, and there's enough meat on the bone here that I'm like, I'm interested to see where a sequel could go. Definitely. Yeah. So for me, I give Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes an 8 out of 10, which ranks it as great. I think this is technically, I think it's better than Rise. 
Okay. If I'm ranking the four of them, if I'm taking like the three and then put four, I'm taking Kingdom above Rise. Yeah, I'm taking Dawn, War, Kingdom, Rise. I can that see would that. Be my, that would be my order for the four. I can see that. Like, I think this is slightly better than Rise. Like, I enjoyed it more than I do Rise, mostly because it's no James Franco. <laughs> Uh, all right, Todd, tell everyone how they can find us and get in touch with us on social media. We're at Tau Capes on YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram. Tau Capes Podcast on Facebook. You can also email us at TauCapesPod at gmail.com. If you enjoy the show, please consider leaving a like on the video and subscribing to the channel. Be on the lookout for this week's Popcorn Mumbles. We'll be taking a look at the 2001 film Planet of the Apes. Yikes. <laughs> uh, Tau Capes will return next week. We want to thank you so much for listening. Until next time. Bye, guys. See you guys.